This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. Welcome to Medical Monday, a special Heart to Heart with Anna podcast for Heart One, February 2022. I am Rosalind Rivera and the guest host of this special podcast. I am also a heart warrior and a pediatric cardiology nurse. On Medical Mondays, we will investigate different medical devices that have been created to improve the lives of people born with congenital heart defects. Today, we will be talking about 3D printed hearts, and our guest is Dr. Gregory Perrins. Dr. Perrin has been a pediatric cardiologist at UCLA since 2006. His clinical interests include Marfan syndrome, echocardiography, and a focus on 3D printing and virtual reality assessment of congenital heart disease to plan surgery and cardiac catheterization. Dr. Perrin, can you tell us more about 3D printing hearts and how this is advancing the field of congenital cardiology? Sure. 3D printing of hearts is not necessarily brand new, but it is becoming a much more used technology to help teams caring for patients with congenital heart disease, both children and adults. Now, these 3D printed hearts are originating from CT scans or MRI that the team has ordered for a patient. So once someone gets either a CT or MRI of their heart and or heart vessels, then there is a process whereby that information can be taken through some computer programs, incorporating a bit of artificial intelligence, shall we say, and then that information and that heart model on the computer can be sent to a 3D printer. And the final product is actually a representation of that imaging and of the patient's heart. And then the procedural team, whether it be a surgical team or a catheterization team, can review that model and plan their procedure. Now, if it's surgery, Potentially, a surgery could be attempted on the model. If it is a catheter-based procedure in the catheter lab, certain devices can be tested for size and appropriateness on these models. Now, the models aren't necessarily the entire heart. Most often, what they represent is a hollow model of what we call the blood pool or the contrasted blood pool that we'll see on the CT or MRI. And then we make a hollow model of that. And what that represents on the inside is sort of the inside of one's heart that a surgeon would see and thus operate on or that a catheter would interact with during a procedure. So that's the basic idea behind what you get out of a 3D model and how that helps. There are numerous uses at this point in congenital heart disease for these 3D models. In other words, there are a number of types of surgeries that are quite complex where looking at two-dimensional pictures on either an echocardiogram or even on a CT or MRI, don't necessarily give you the full understanding that a three-dimensional either image or model in your hand would give you. For example, maybe the most common use for pre-surgical planning would be double outlet right ventricle. Now, these can be very complex hearts, and often the surgeon will want to create a two ventricle heart or what we call biventricular repair. Now, just looking at two dimensional images doesn't necessarily tell you how the surgeon is going to be able to divide the two sides of the heart and whether or not 
doing that is going to create other problems. So if the surgeon is able to either review a 3D model on the computer or hold that patient's heart, it's the exact size and anatomy that that patient has, he or she can review the important anatomic landmarks and decide either how the surgery is going to be done or whether it could be done at all. Another example from the catheterization lab would be testing devices that close holes. Now, many of these procedures, such as atrial septal defects, can be done without 3D models, but there are some complicated ventricular septal defects or VSDs where testing a specific device ahead of time really gives the catheter doctor a better idea of what device to use and which way that hole could be approached. One final example would be there is somewhat of a new procedure that is becoming more common, although it's a very complicated procedure and only certain institutions are doing it, whereby anomalous pulmonary veins that are connected to the superior vena cava, which is termed PAPVR or partial anomalous pulmonary venous return, can be ameliorated in the catheter lab with a stent, specifically a covered stent. Now, this is somewhat of the new complicated procedure. And what we will do before we do that procedure in the cath lab is to 3D print a soft sort of elastic 3D model of that region of the patient's heart, including all of those veins. And what the catheter doctor can do is actually place a stent that is similar or the same to the one they will use during the procedure into that model that's, again, exactly the size of the patient's heart and vessels and see whether this procedure is appropriate for that patient. So I hope that gives some examples of how we would use 3D models to prepare for these procedures. Thank you, Dr. Perians. I was wondering, are these models ever given to the patients and where do you store them? Yes, on occasion, I can provide a model to the patient. What I do in most cases is I can give the patients a 3D computerized model of either their heart or their child's heart, and they can actually have this on their phone. So there are a number of programs that can be downloaded on different types of phones that allow for viewing of these type of computer files, specifically called STL files. That's the type of uh, file that holds this 3D information. So what I will do if a patient asks for their child's model is I will have them download one of these programs onto their phone. And if I have the child's or the adult's computer file that holds that 3D information in my email or in a file bank, I will simply airdrop the file onto their phone or email it to them and have them pull it up on their phone. And then right there on their phone, they can have their family members 3D representation of their heart on their phone. And with your finger, you can move that heart around in all three dimensions and view it and also slice in and out of it. So basically someone can have a, a copy of their heart right on their phone or on their computer. The rest of the models are stored basically in our office area. And we use these for preoperative planning, obviously. And we do quite a bit of teaching with them as well. You know, I have a rather large bank of 3D models at this point. We've done about 80 patients' hearts in 3D prints over the last three years. And so, you know, there are various types of, as I mentioned, double outlet right ventricle that's actually, even for cardiology trainees, rather hard to understand. And having probably 10 at least types of double outlet right ventricle in 3D model form, it has actually made it much easier to teach cardiology fellows the complex anatomy. And what's interesting is that I can actually take a complex heart with some 
rare, complicated form of double outlet right ventricle. And I can show this to pediatric residents who otherwise aren't specifically studying cardiology and might understand the basics of the simple hole, but not too much beyond that. And if I take this 3D model and hand it to a pediatric intern who's just starting out as a doctor, I can pretty easily explain what that anatomy is, and they will actually quite well understand what needs to be done for that heart when they're holding the model in their hand. So I think they're invaluable for education as well. And that's the other place where we've used these quite frequently. That's wonderful. I would love to have my 3D heart on my phone. I'm just wondering also, should patients with complex congenital heart defects ask for these 3D models to have on their phones, especially like older teens before they head off to college or move away from a home? That's something you think is reasonable that they should have? The 3D models, again, are made from the information on a CT scanner MRI that has contrast enhanced blood on it. In other words, the patient must have had one of these types of images where they would have received a intravenous line or IV. And while the image was taken, contrast is ejected into their blood that highlights the heart and the blood vessels. Now, this is something that's very frequently done before surgery or other procedures on patients' hearts with congenital heart disease. So I think that if someone already has that type of information in their chart, then I think having a 3D model made is potentially something appropriate. If someone has some form of congenital heart disease, whether they've been operated on or not, but haven't needed to have a contrast enhanced image of their heart, I'm not sure I'd necessarily go through that type of procedure, which may or may not require anesthesia and requires contrast. I'm not sure I'd go through that just to get the 3D model. Furthermore, I think what might be more important than just having these models just to view or for fun, I think what's more important is whether or not the procedure that one is going to have would benefit from having a 3D model. I think more and more cardiac centers out there are using 3D printing as based on what you see in the literature and talking to other physicians at other places. But certainly there are institutions, hospitals, even in the United States, where either for funding reasons, inability to create the models, it's just not thought to be that helpful. Now, one thing that I did was when I started out, we basically had no funding or money for this endeavor. And I think a lot of institutions or cardiac centers think, well, if we don't have the money to do this, it costs a lot of money to 3D print, so we can't do it. But that's not true. So when I started out, I went out and bought a $800 3D printer that, you know, maybe a eighth or ninth grader or someone who uses it as a hobby to create, you know, action figures maybe would use. And there are a couple of free programs that anyone can download off the internet that will allow you to create these models from these CT scans or MRIs. So, and then the material costs for making the model on one of those simple hobby printers is probably per model $1. Now, that isn't necessarily the best way to make a heart model to prepare for surgery, but it can be done. Now we've upgraded and we have a $3,000 printer and I would estimate the costs per model would maybe be somewhere between 20 and $50 now, but still it's not in the thousands of dollars and the printer is a very reasonable cost for medical care. So I think it can be done and I think we've proven that. So last question for you, you said that you use the 3D models to help educate residents and fellows. Do you ever use the models to help educate patients about their own hearts? Absolutely. And when 
the surgeon will do a consult with a family and patient with congenital heart disease. Often, if the patient has had a 3D model made that we have reviewed for the case, the surgeon and nurse practitioners will bring those models to the appointment and go over them in the clinic with the family so that hopefully the family will have a better understanding of the heart disease. I think as much as any type of procedure that people can have, often congenital heart surgeries and congenital heart anatomy is very complicated and confusing. If it's difficult for trainees and pediatricians to understand these hearts, certainly non-medical families must have an extremely difficult time understanding what type of surgery their family members having. So I hope that having these models for the cases where we use them and having the surgery team, nurse practitioners or surgeon show the family helps them understand somewhat what this heart is and what type of procedure they're going to have. Thank you so much, Dr. Perkins. Thank you so much, Rosalind Rivera, for being our guest host and Dr. Perrins for being a guest on our program and for teaching us about 3D printed hearts. I learned so much about this new technology. Thanks for listening today, my friends. Don't forget to join us tomorrow. Tori Geiger, a heart warrior author, will be joining me to share with me her story about how she came to write a book about resiliency. Until then, remember, my friends, you are not alone.